Number 8. In July 2015, a horrifying video surfaced, showcasing several people being murdered while at the middle of the ocean. The footage, taken on a cell phone camera, was discovered after the phone was left inside a taxi in Fiji and turned over to the police. The 10-minute recording shows four men being shot one by one as they hopelessly cling to what looks like the wreckage of an overturned wooden boat and surrounded by several large white tuna longliners. The men on the boat from which the shots are fired can be heard speaking in Mandarin and interpreters for television New Zealand have identified Taiwanese, Thai and Vietnamese voices on the video. One man can be heard saying, shoot, shoot, shoot. Someone else says, if you see anyone, just kill. Look ahead there, one and two. Soon after, a group of men on deck who appear to be crew members laugh among themselves then pose for selfies. It is believed that the location of the murder happened just outside Fijian waters, but according to Radio Australia boat owners and contractors in Suva, told police they believe the footage is from a failed pirate attack off the Somali coast sometime in 2012 or 2013. However, maritime security experts warning that piracy has become a convenient cover for sometimes fatal score settling. They said it is just as likely that the men were local fishermen in disputed waters, mutinied crew, cast off stowaways, or thieves caught stealing fish or bait. With no bodies, no known victims, and not even an accurate location, no government appears willing to take responsibility for the investigation. Despite dozens of witnesses on at least four ships, those killings remain a mystery other than to identify one of the trawlers as belonging to a Taiwanese company, which offered no usable leads. Number 7 The sinking of MV Seawall, also referred to as the Seawall Ferry Disaster, occurred on the morning of 16 April 2014 when the passenger Row Row Ferry was en route from Incheon towards Jeju Island. The South Korean ferry sank while carrying 476 people, mostly secondary students from Danwon High School. In total, 304 passengers and crew members died in the disaster. Harrowing footage from inside the doomed seawall ferry just moments before it capsized shows school students joking and laughing as the ship begins to list dramatically. The shaky video was on the cell phone of a 17-year-old student, Park Su Hyun, when rescuers recovered his body. In the video, students initially joking before became gradually more concerned as the ferry becomes increasingly unstable. At the end of the footage, one child can be heard saying, this looks like the end. Another heartbreakingly adds, these are the pictures we need to take as our last memories. Another boy says, mom, dad, I love you. Only one can be seen wearing a life jacket at the beginning of the video clips, which start at 8.52 a.m. and end with a small break between them at 9.09 when everyone appears to be wearing them. As the fairy lists, they joke about final commemorative pictures and defying gravity by trying to walk on the walls. One student can be heard saying, this is fun, and another says, this is like Titanic. The fairy then starts to list and shake. One of the boys can be heard saying, I want to get off, we don't want to die. Several times the students are warned over the loudspeaker to stay where they are, even as the tilting increases and it becomes less possible for them to flee. On 15 May 2014, the captain and three crew members were charged with murder, while the other 11 of the crew were indicted for abandoning the ship. Number 6 On December 7, 2009, 28-year-old Susan Powell, her husband Joshua, and the couple's young sons Charlie and Brayden were reported missing when Susan didn't show up for her job and her children never arrived at daycare. 
Hours after the family's sudden disappearance was reported to law enforcement, Joshua, along with his sons, returned to the West Valley, Utah home he shared with Susan. When the authorities questioned Joshua about his wife's whereabouts, he said he took his sons Charlie 4 and Brayden 2 camping just after midnight that same day, leaving his wife alive and well behind in their home, and he had no idea where Susan was. However, Joshua's story didn't make any sense to police, largely because it seemed unusual for someone to take two young children camping in the middle of the night, but also because of the storm that had blanketed the area with snow. Police checked inside the Powell's house and noticed a section of carpet was wet, and someone had set up two fans in an effort to dry the damp area. Officials also found blood, which they later determined to be from Susan Powell on the tile floor. Near the spot of blood was a sofa, which investigators concluded had been recently cleaned. Given Susan's disappearance, signs someone had cleaned blood off the floor and furniture, and Joshua's bizarre story about an impromptu camping trip, authorities began to suspect Susan may have been the victim of foul play perpetrated by her husband. Investigators learned Susan Powell had multiple life insurance policies worth a total of $1.5 million, giving Joshua Powell, who had filed for bankruptcy in 2007, plenty of incentive to harm his wife. Officers also discovered that Susan had handwritten a will and stored the document in a safety deposit box. In the will, Susan said she and her husband, whom she had married in 2001, had been having marital problems for four years. And she wrote that if she were to die, it may not be an accident, even if it looks like one. In addition to the secret will, investigators also found a video Susan had made, in which she recorded her family's home and belongings just in case something happened to her. In the video, one of her beloved boys is in the background as she takes a tour of their home. She ends the video with these haunting words. Hopefully everything works out and we all live happily ever after, as much as that's possible. Unfortunately, on February 5, 2012, Josh killed their two boys. He poured gasoline around the house and attacked them with a hatchet. Then he set the house aflame, ending both his children's lives as well as his own. On May 21, 2013, West Valley City Police declared the case cold. Susan's body still hadn't been found, and there were still countless questions left unanswered. But the lead suspect was dead. The investigation was shut down, and every question about Susan's disappearance was laid to rest. Number 5 On Thanksgiving in 2012, Haley Kiefer, 18, and her cousin Nicholas Brady, 17, broke into the home of Byron David Smith, 65, in Little Falls, Minnesota. They thought the house was empty, but Smith was waiting for them in the basement with a loaded rifle. He opened fire and killed both of them as they entered the room. According to investigators, Smith first shot Brady two times while he was at the top of the stairs. Then he delivered a fatal shot to the head when the teen landed on the floor of the basement. Kiefer followed the sound of the gunshots and Smith shot her as well. When she fell down the stairs, Smith attempted to shoot her again at close range, but his rifle jammed. He then proceeded to unload bullets into her chest with a revolver before shooting her once under the chin, killing her instantly. Prior to the incident, Byron Smith had been burglarized at least a dozen times over the preceding few months. Among the items stolen were thousands of dollars in cash, the watch his father had received after spending nearly a year as a prisoner of war in World War II. Medals and ribbons Smith had earned in the Air Force during the Vietnam War, several firearms, and jewelry. Smith began routinely wearing a holster with a loaded gun inside his home. There is some evidence that Kiefer and Brady committed at least a couple of the previous break-ins and were being investigated for prior burglaries, including one earlier on the day they were killed. Smith installed a security system to protect himself. On October 29, Smith wrote a memo to sheriff's officials 
asking authorities to investigate recent burglaries at his house, but to no avail. Surveillance video footage from Byron Smith's home shows four different camera views of his home. He is seen getting into his truck around 11.25 a.m. and returning without it about 15 minutes later. Brady is caught on camera looking in through Smith's windows and walking around the house. The video does not show how Brady broke into the home. Kiefer is also seen on camera walking around the house, but the footage does not reveal how she got inside. Smith was convicted of premeditated murder and sentenced to life in prison without any possibility of parole. Number 4 Mari Troy Travis was an American serial killer who committed suicide in a St. Louis County jail after being arrested for murder. Travis murdered at least 12 prostitutes and claimed to have killed 17, all in separate incidents between 2000 and 2002 in his home in Ferguson, Missouri. He was caught when he anonymously mailed a map to the body of one of his victims to the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, which was later found to have come from Expedia.com and linked to his computer. When police searched the home of Travis, they found a secret torture chamber in the basement with bondage equipment, a stun gun, and clippings. They also found blood splatters on the walls and floor. But most chilling of all, they found a videotape containing footage of his crimes. The tape labeled Your Wedding Day showed Travis tying women up and torturing and raping them. One scene showed him apparently strangling one of his victims to death. This is first kill, number one. First kill was 19 years old. Name. The scenes on the tape were so disturbing that Chief Police Joe Makwa ordered psychological counseling for the officers who viewed them. Travis, a 36-year-old hotel waiter, hanged himself in jail before admitting to any of the murders. But St. Louis police believe he killed between 12 and 20 women. They have identified 12 of his victims as drug-addicted prostitutes whose bodies were dumped along city streets and country roads in the St. Louis area between March 2001 and May 2002. Police believe Travis picked up prostitutes along a strip of Broadway just north of St. Louis that is riddled with crack houses and prostitution, then took them to his ranch-style home in Ferguson, a nearby suburb. They found numerous videotapes in Travis' home showing him giving the prostitutes crack cocaine to smoke, then having consensual sex with them. He apparently let some of the women leave at that point. The wedding tape included similar scenes, including a shot of a woman sitting on Travis' bed after an introductory caption, another crackhead hoe. In some cases, Travis would start asking the women to engage in bizarre rituals such as having them dance in white clothes or wear sunglasses with the lenses blackened so they could not see. I didn't tell you, Tara. See right there. Then he would take them captive, binding them with ropes and handcuffs and covering their eyes with duct tape. He would then begin to torment them, either in the bedroom or after dragging them downstairs to the basement and shackling them to a wooden post. Travis would torment the women verbally, taunting them about their fate and haranguing some of them over how they had abandoned their children for crack. I can't hear you what you're you saying. Are Say it clear. You are the master. They're pleasing me to serve you. You are the master. They pleases me to serve you. Stop you are the master. Please me. When they examined the basement after his arrest, police found that the walls had been repainted several times, with layers of paint, then blood, then paint, then blood. 
Travis was arrested after sending a letter to a reporter for the St. Louis Post Dispatch, taunting him for writing a sob story about one of his victims. He attached a computer generated map to the letter, marked with an X where he said police would find a body. They found a skeleton at the site and traced the map to Travis' computer. After his arrest, Travis was locked in a super maximum security jail cell and put on suicide watch with a guard outside his door. But during a one hour shower break, Travis managed to hang himself in the back corner using a thin rope he had braided from a torn up sheet. He had also bound his own hands behind his back. Number three. On May 7, 2007, a father bought a baby monitor with a camera to keep an eye on his newborn baby when he received a stray signal from a similar device being used in a neighboring house in the quiet town of Kurram, close to the southeastern city of Brno. Through his baby monitor, he saw a live feed of two boys who were being tortured and recognized a woman in the video as his neighbor and called the cops. When police searched the area on May 10, sisters Clara and Katerina Morova allegedly refused to open a locked door in their home. When firemen broke it down, they found Clara's eight-year-old son, Andre, inside, bound with duct tape and watched over by a video camera. It was discovered that Andre was beaten and made to eat his own vomit. His brother, 10-year-old Jacob, endeared the same treatment as well as cigarette burns, being submerged in water and sexually abused. Andre had some of his skin removed and was still bleeding. It is believed his skin had been cut off in strips and was eaten by his own mother, 31-year-old Clara Marova, Clara's cult members, and himself. The boys were malnourished and dehydrated and in very poor health. They had endured six months of torture at the hands of family members. Police rescued the two boys and a 13-year-old girl named Annika, whom a court had allowed Clara Marova to adopt in March. However, when Annika was in the children's home, she suddenly disappeared, sparking a search for her in nearby woods and villages. Then came the bizarre revelation that Annika was not a 13-year-old girl, but a 33-year-old woman in disguise. Police believe Annika was actually Barbara Skolova, a friend of the Marova sisters, who, like them, belonged to a breakaway faction of an organization called the Grail Movement. Police started a nationwide hunt for Barbara Skrlova and eventually found her in Norway. This time, she had been posing as a 13-year-old boy named Adam and was adopted by another family. She was arrested and sent back to the Czech Republic to stand trial. Clara admitted to abusing her children, but she said she and her sister were brainwashed by Barbara. She claimed that Barbara had incited the torture gradually by convincing them that the boys needed more discipline. Clara said that Barbara claimed her former doctor, an unknown cult member, could advise them. According to Clara, they received detailed instructions on how to torture the boys from the doctor via text messages. Clara received nine years in prison her sister, Katerina, 35, was jailed for 10 years for her crimes. Barbara was sentenced for five years. Number two. On the night of September 22, 2006, 16-year-old Cassie Jo Stoddard was house-sitting for her aunt and uncle, Allison and Frank Contreras, in her hometown of Pocatello, Idaho. Pocatello is a quiet, largely Mormon town in southwest Idaho, the kind of town where everyone felt safe and kids didn't have curfews, the kind of community who never saw this horrific crime coming. Cassie Jo was a junior at Pocatello High School, and that night she decided to invite three of her classmates over to the house to keep her company. She invited her boyfriend, Matt, and two of Matt's friends, Brian Draper and Tori Adamsik. The start of the night was pretty uneventful, as the four teens began to watch a movie together. About halfway through the movie, Draper and Adamsik announced they were going to see a film at the local movie theater instead. Approximately 15 minutes after the two teens left the house, 
the electricity suddenly went out. Cassie Joe was frightened, so Matt immediately called his mother to ask permission to stay the night to keep her company. But then the light suddenly went back on and Matt's mom came to pick him up. What happened next is spine tingling. Brian Draper and Tori Adamsik re-entered the house. The teens had been lying in wait outside the home, looking for the perfect opportunity to get Cassie Joe on her own. They entered through the basement, once again cut off the power and waited for Cassie Jo to go down to the basement to turn the power back on. But scared, Cassie Jo remained in the living room. A short time later, Draper and Adamsik went upstairs disguised in dark clothing and masks and stabbed their classmate to death. An autopsy revealed that she had been stabbed approximately 29 times. Nine of the wounds were fatal. Two days later, Cassie Joe's 13-year-old cousin found her dead on the living room floor. The next day, Draper and Adamsik were arrested and charged with the murder. During their interrogations, the teenagers blamed each other, but eventually police found a video of the two boys planning the murder. They also found video footage of Draper and Adamsik talking about the murder right after it happened. We just left her house. This is not a fucking joke. I'm shaking. I stabbed her in the throat and I saw her lifeless body just disappear. Draper then led police to a canyon where he and Adamsik had hidden the knives used in the murder and the clothes they were wearing that night. At their trials, it was revealed that Draper was obsessed with the Columbine High School shootings and he idolized the shooters, Eric Harris and Dylan Klebold. Adam Sick was a horror movie buff, and he would admit to being inspired by the Scream movie franchise. There should be no odd against killing people. I know it's a wrong thing, but hell, 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 you restrict somebody from it, they're going to want it more. Both teenagers admitted they wanted to kill someone, anyone, and Cassie Joe, house-sitting for her aunt and uncle, created the perfect opportunity for them. They said they liked Cassie Jo, but she was just an easy target for them. Allison and Frank Contreras never returned to their home, choosing to never again live in the house where their niece was cruelly murdered. They've tried to sell the house, but year after year it remains on the market. Frank's stepdaughter, who had found Cassie's body, suffered a breakdown and attempted suicide. Both Brian Draper and Tori Adamsik are serving life sentences in jail. Number 1 27 year old Lauren Giddings had just graduated from Mercer University Law School and was studying for the Georgia Bar exam when she mysteriously disappeared in June 2011. Her dismembered torso was found days later in a curbside trash can outside of her apartment. The man accused of killing her is Stephen McDaniel, a fellow law school graduate who lived next door. Lauren was last seen on June 25, but no one realized anything was wrong until four nights later. Friends and family had figured that Lauren was just holed up in her apartment while cramming for the bar exam. When her loved ones noticed that she wasn't returning text messages or even checking her Facebook account, they knew something was amiss. On June 30, 2011, one of Lauren's friends filed a missing persons report after using a key to get into her apartment and noticing that Lauren's cell phone and purse were inside, but Lauren was nowhere to be found. When police arrive on the scene, they discover a human torso in a trash bin outside of Lauren's apartment. The torso was wrapped in a black trash bag clothed in cotton running shorts with nothing underneath. Lauren's next door neighbor, Stephen McDaniel, speaks with reporters and although he's pretty chatty at first, his demeanor visibly changes when the reporter tells him that a body has been found. McDaniel is charged later that day with burglary after he allegedly admitted to police that he broke into other apartments in the complex and stole condoms. Police conducted a search on his apartment and found a camera with photos and footage. The photos were accompanied by various erased videos which show McDaniel filming Lauren from within her backroom bedroom. He had been watching her, filming her for hours before the murder took place. 
Police officials found over 250 different pieces of evidence proving McDaniel was at the scene of the crime that night, including video footage that clearly shows he is in her room. After being arrested and held in police custody for 10 months, McDaniel confessed to the murder and pleaded guilty on April 21, 2012. He received a sentence of life in prison.